Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to the second day of our fall virtual conference. Big thanks to Beer 30 by the Fifth Ingredient, Pneumatic Scale, Angelus, and Pro Brew Supply. And I'm really excited for this chat for two reasons. First off, I've been behind the screen for a really long time the past couple of days. I'm excited for a little bit of human interaction. Actually, three reasons. I'm excited to hang out with three of my favorite people, not just in craft beer, but just in life. And I'm excited to talk about a really important topic. Today, we're going to talk about transforming beverage culture from within. And the basis for this conversation is on the Safe Bars Pact Initiative. The Safe Bars and Pact Initiative unites beverage professionals and trade associations who want to proactively make a long-term commitment to establishing safer, more respectful work and drinking spaces for employees and consumers. It was our goal to make this easy for companies to get started. You can sign up by completing the sign-up form at safebarspact.org. You're going to receive and share the PAC code of conduct with your team. You'll go through Safe Bar's training to become Safe Bar certified and proudly display your official Safe Bar certification seal. And together we can make a difference. And as I said, I'm here today with some fantastic human beings. And without further ado, I'd love for each of you to introduce yourselves. Betsy, you're to my right. You get to go first. All right. Uh, I'm Betsy Lay, owner, head brewer, co-founder of Lady Justice Brewing in Aurora, Colorado. Betsy, I feel like I haven't seen you in forever. And it was only like a month ago when we were hanging out in Denver. So good to no, see you. it's sad. And AJ, you just got back from a beautiful trip in Iceland. So it's great to see you again. I'm a little bit jealous, but excited to see you today. But for everyone who hasn't had the pleasure to meet you, who are you and what do you do? <laughs> yes, uh, I'm AJ Head. I'm program manager with Safe Bars, which is an empowerment self-defense um, nonprofit uh, based out of Washington, D.C., which we'll be talking more about today, I think. It was great to connect with you and Lauren recently. Well, not recently. It's been quite a few months now, but I appreciate this friendship. Yeah, absolutely. Agreed. And Dana, we haven't seen each other since last week when we dove a little bit into your story. But for everyone who hasn't catched, you know, what you do in the industry, tell everybody a little bit about who you are. Cool. Um, yeah, I am Dana, uh, Dana Klusny. And I'm uh, based out of the traditional land and territories of the Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples in Collingwood, Ontario, Canada. And I'm the, um, the founder of Social Impact Projects. So I'm a project management facilitator. Uh, and I mostly work with group projects that want to do good, but also feel good in the process. And uh, I'm also the co-founder of Enswell Beer, which is going to be a small batch brewery here in Collingwood. That's all, yeah, yeah. That's uh, all for uh, beer for people who love beer with people. So nice. people gathering together and feeling safe together is like top of mind for me always. And especially right now. For a second, I thought you might leave out the fact that you're about to open a brewery. So I might have to drive north of the border to come meet you someday, but I'm excited for once your tap room opens. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I, I, I'm starting to like, re, I think I told you like the double entrepreneur. I'm trying to remember to let people know that, yes, we're, we're also trying to start a brewery. And so Dana just used the term double entrepreneur, which I absolutely love. <laughs> so I guess it represents an entrepreneur who's, you know, dividing their time between two different businesses. It just, it just sounds, I don't know. It has a nice ring to it. Yeah. Well, for all of you here today and Julie Rose with Not Your Hobby Marketing will be joining us very, very shortly. I'd love to hear why this topic is important to you and why the PACT initiative is something you want to get behind. And I'll start because I'm part of the <laughs> too, and I've enjoyed the opportunity to get to know the <laughs> You know, we want to use craft beer professionals as a vehicle for positive change and topics like this. and are extremely vital. We have to have the uncomfortable conversations if we truly want to make a difference. And being part of the PACT initiative has allowed us within ourselves to understand what we want to make of this project and put out a product to the industry we hope will actually, you know, help achieve the goals that we have. And so it's been a pleasure getting to know you three and, you know, spreading this with the world. And now your turn. Why is this project and topic important to everyone here? You know, as a brewery owner and a brewer and, you know, I exist within the brewing industry every day. It's just good. Um, it's just good to see a, a long-term commitment being made to making some shifts in the culture. And I think that's really what all of this is about is like making, making some real shifts in, in the, the brewing industry as a whole. Um, so that 
so that we can last longer. I mean, I have, um, there are a lot of really wonderful people, um, a majority of them who are women who are leaving the industry uh, because it's not a, um, it doesn't feel like a, a safe, welcoming place for them to work. And that's um, that's not what I want out of my industry. And it's also not what I want out of the customers who walk in um, to any tap room anywhere. Um, beer, beer is cool. And, um, and anybody should feel like they belong um, in, in the beer space. And I love how mission driven lady justice is everything you do has meaning behind it in some way, whether it's the beers you brew or the people you align with, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, that was on purpose for sure. <laughs> <laughs> kind of why we exist. <laughs> You know, I, I, I let me jump in then, because beer is cool. That's the last thing you said, Betsy. <laughs> and and um, um, safe bars, we had to re react to an infiltrator of this culture, which is this underlying kind of unwelcome, but like definitely minority, but has a, a large voice and impact um, in the culture. But um, the infiltrator is this this underlying harassment, sexual assault that that goes with um, beer community or alcohol community, beverages, um, adult beverage communities. You know, um, so Safe Bars responded because of this kind of correlation between because of alcohol and violence, but it's an, it's a it's a false correlation. It's a, a false causality because actually craft brewery illustrates this so beautifully that intention and the the culture of community and um opening the lines of communication also is go goes hand in hand with this this craft brewery industry so um i think the response to to the infiltrator is why we're all here today yeah mm -hmm. And, and at this point in time, I'd like to welcome Julie Rhodes to the stage. Julie, it's been a pleasure getting to know you the past few years. And for everyone who hasn't had the opportunity to, one, catch you yesterday, giving a great talk in CDP or interact with you personally, who are you? And what do you do in the craft beverage industry? Hey, yeah. So for all the parents out there, I'm swinging in from afternoon pickup of my kiddos. So <laughs> juggling uh, the mom land of, of the beer industry today. Uh, hi, I'm Julie Rhodes. I'll be fast with this because I don't want to interrupt um, and take up too much people's time. I run a, a strategic advisory service consultant, C Let's call it what it is, um, educational services company uh, specializing in um, helping people with their outside sales, digital marketing tactics, and distribution management. Um, I'm located in Colorado. Uh, I've been in business for about a couple decades of experience in this industry, and I am super excited to be here talking about PACT and the Safe Bars PACT initiative. So thank you. No, thanks for being here. And Dana, we'll go back to you on this one. You know, why is this so important to you? Yeah, well, I want to, uh, um, what Betsy mentioned about this industry being so great, the beverage industry being so great, and it also being so sad that we're losing amazing people, talented people, people with incredible contributions to grow and evolve this industry. We're losing them because of various, like, you know, various acts of oppression, of course, across somebody's time within the industry. Mm -hmm. And I'm an example of that. I left the craft beer industry after eight years and it was my passion. It was my love and gender based harassment and bullying. I was like, there's no space for me. And I left and um, it was heartbreaking and I'm not alone. Um, since I started sharing my story openly and advocating um, for safer spaces in the craft beer space and just starting to do repair work and acknowledging the repair that needs to happen, I've had more people reach out to me sharing their stories of why they left and how now they, they're reframing. They used to feel guilty about leaving, that they should have stuck it out. Mm -hmm. And they're reframing that now. Um, thanks to other voices that are coming forward going, wait, I'm not the problem. 
this system's the problem. And like, what are we doing to make sure that we have um, that we're creating a space, not just for patrons to feel safe, but the people who are there, like it's, it's for everyone. Like we say, it's for the greater good of everyone. So that's why I'm here. And, and my re-entry into the craft beer industry is through the safe bars packed initiative. And also through my partner and I deciding, okay, well, we're going to create a space for people to gather um, and we're going to do it differently. Awesome. Thanks for that, Dana. And Julie, your turn. Why is this important to you? Mm. Uh, so I'm one of those people that I don't have like uh, one particular story like of experience with let's see, harassment, violence, discrimination, all gender-based at some point in my career, because it is very widespread. The biggest difference with me is that I've always been on the business side. So this has been in a sales capacity, marketing capacity, management capacity, distributor, uh, supplier side sales, you know, things like that, right? Um, there were a couple of instances, um, I don't want to say production related, but in that environment, because I am married to a brewer, so I'm no stranger to being around a brewing production facility as well, and being in that environment and being in tap rooms and things like that. So um, we don't have enough time in this session for me to recount <laughs> all the all the not so fun memories of times where I should have spoken up. I shouldn't have brush, brushed things under the rug. Um, comes from a lot of years of just saying, oh, it's a boys club. It is what it is, right? It's That's the way it is. It's locker room talk, right? That's, yeah. So enough of that. It feels, uh, it's a combination of total frustration combined with exhaustion, um, combined with hope for a different way to re-envision our entire industry. You know, so it's a lot of mixed feelings, right? But um, the reason I wanted to do this is because I do think that we can create a cultural and organizational shift in this industry. I do. Otherwise, I wouldn't have involved myself with this project in the first place. And I I want to normalize talking about this kind of thing. Um, the more we get used to talking about uncomfortable things, you know, the more progress that we get, the more forward progress um, that we can make. And, you know, there's going to be missteps. People are going to trip and fall on their face. I do all the time lots of road rash and bumps and bruises from talking about this kind of stuff. Um, I think the biggest reason that I wanted to go this direction is because it's internally facing. So I really just want to like channel all of this change that we're seeing this momentum, right. That we have going into saying like, Hey, owner operators, let's get a new structure going. Let, let's, you know, Yes, there's a lot of stuff that we can talk about, but there's also a lot of other marginalized groups, even when the, within this panel, just right here looking at these faces, there's a lot of things that we could talk about with internal change, you know? Um, but let's maybe step back. And I think all of us took a step back and with Dana's guidance, you know, saying like, what's our ask, right? Like, what, are we, what can we ask people to do? And like, who do we want to talk to? Um, when it comes to this kind of thing and where can we exert the most impact with having um, something as wonderful as safe bar certification and how can we spread the word about that? So I think that if you can tell my enthusiasm for that, all that was a big long winded answer, but yeah, that's why I'm here. <laughs> well, it's very infectious. And, and the four of you just inspire me to work harder on social change projects like this. When I hear the stories you share of unfortunate things that have happened to you, my friends in the industry, it just upsets me to, so much. But they shouldn't happen to anyone at all in the spaces that we aim to create. And I just really hope this helps makes that positive difference. And Betsy, I like to ask you because you are so mission driven with regard to everything you do at Lady Justice. 
you know, how do your customers support you when you get behind projects like this? Is it something they expect from them? You know, how do you take everything you're passionate about and share it with those in whatever manner you feel fit? Hmm. How do we do it? I don't know. We just do it. And um, <laughs> I don't know that there's necessarily a magic formula other than we try to be as transparent as possible. And we try to just be um, intentional and honest about who we are and, and the work that we're doing. And uh, we don't get a lot of pushback most of the time. You know, um, our crowd tends to come and hang out with us because they understand who we are and what our mission is. And so I think, I think that's helped us being so mission driven has really helped us a lot um, because it's, it's really easy to do or not do something <laughs> according to our own like company values and our own company mission. And so we can take a step back and look at something and, and we do this honestly all the time where I, you know, we'll get requests for things or, um, certain asks or people will want opinions about one thing or the other. And I have to take a step back and be like, all right, does this fit into what we said we were going to do? Does this feel good? Sometimes it's a gut reaction and sometimes it's just like, no, very clearly on paper, <laughs> uh, this is not what we're about. And so I think just having that sort of focus actually really helps a lot. Um, and I, I try to talk about this in any talk that I give when, when we're talking about community and culture and brewing is, um, you have to know your own goals and your own values and your own mission. And once you have that, then it kind of, everything else kind of falls into place. It makes making these decisions a whole lot easier. And our, our customers, I think can see that. I think it'll only deepen True. your relationships and those bonds with your customers. Yeah. Yeah, no, it does. Yeah. Now, Julie, you're in an interesting situation because you run a business that helps breweries run a better business, but you're also passionate about social justice issues. How does that play out with your customers and how do you balance, you know, your passion for both? Oh, that's a tough question, actually, um, because I'm not I'm not formally trained in HR. You know what I mean? That's um, my uh, people that know me know my three lanes of expertise are like outside sales, digital marketing, distribution. Right. Um, but what I have found in helping people with those lanes is that it all spills into infrastructure, right? Like no matter how, like no matter how hard I tell people like, Oh no, I'm not going to mess with your infrastructure. <laughs> it, all, it all melds into infrastructure and like making sure that you have those pillars in place, because if you don't know what you're, you know, you can't, you can't run before you walk. Right. So you've got to go back to basics almost all the time. And what's funny is that it's actually been a somewhat of an evolution of my company the past couple of years that I did not expect it to take this turn um, in that I'm like, well, I educate myself about this. Like, why can't I teach others about this? Like I, you know, am I an HR specialist? No, but I, I do teach leadership and management and, you know, I can help people build better infrastructures. And it's literally as simple as, like a, like a Google doc with a code of conduct or another Google doc with a social media, um, agreement, right. Or, you know, making sure that you get prevention and bystander training just as often as you get like tips training or serve safe training, you know, and it's not rocket science, right? Like, and I have to give full credit to the, I mean, I would have a laundry list of people that I've learned from, that I paid to learn from, by the way, with the caveat of that. And it is something I knew that I was not an expert in that. So I did make the financial and effort investment to educate myself on that side of it. Because if I can teach better infrastructures, I can teach better sales, hands down, no doubt, which is really, that was kind of the ethos of my talk on Monday morning was that I mean, that's science. That's not my opinion. That's statistics that inclusive and equitable companies last longer. They're more profitable. They're more innovative. They're more creative. They garner better talent. They have less turnover. There's like a gazillion reasons why you should do this for your business. So I feel like it's a new caveat of my company that I didn't expect, but that I'm 
stoked about. So no, that's great insight there. And AJ, I mean, you're, you're a warrior for helping companies, you know, create better cultures. You know, do you find that when companies, you know, work with safe bars and dedicate towards a long term change, that it deepens their ties, not only with everyone on their team, but also their guests? Oh, absolutely. For, for sure. Um, we, we go in, we, um, first of all, we just listen to what is already happening. Um, I think particularly for craft brewing and brewing industry, um, in general, this industry kind of lends itself already to wanting to, to be better people, you know, business people. Um, so when we go in, you're already having the conversations that we're, we're introducing, you know, um, we're just in giving you more tools to use. Um, so yeah, uh, we find that when we go in and, and, um, continue and further the conversations, it does enhance the, the business, it enhances the community and it enhances the, the overall culture of, of, you know, the individual company and also the, the outlying community. And Dana, you're about to open a brewery really soon. I'm, I'm so happy for you. So I'm going to keep mentioning it. But, you know, when you first had the desire to open a brewery, did you think you'd be focusing so much on the culture and environment you wanted to create? Or was the initial idea, let's make a really good beer. I'll do it with my husband. You know, what was your mindset, you know, when you had that versus what it is now? Okay. So, uh, my husband will tell you firsthand because we've had a lot of boundary conversations. Um, I'm not interested in starting a brewery because I'm interested in making beer. That That's his passion. I'm interested in being a part of a brewery because I want to create a space where people can gather and learn about one another and relationship building. I want staff and the people to like, you know, have opportunities to learn more about themselves. The organizational culture is the only reason why I'm getting back into craft beer. That's why I loved craft beer in the first place was the organizational culture. Unfortunately, I was drinking the Kool-Aid and did not realize that, um, that because I'm white and I'm able-bodied, you know, cisgendered, you know, attractive, that um, I could just be shielded away from some of the bullshit that was happening, you know, around me. And then as soon as my eyes were open, unfortunately, because I witnessed acts of oppression and experienced them, I was like, holy shit, this is what I've been swimming in. These are the waters I've been swimming in. This Dana, wash your mouth, please. Yeah. That <laughs> <laughs> you know, I get. Um, and so, yeah, the, uh, I mean, part of me returning to it and my husband and I um, doing this together is because we want to do it differently. We can be we believe that it can be done differently. And um, there's a lot of people that want to enjoy a space. They want to enjoy craft beer and they want to enjoy a space where they feel safe and respected both as staff and as patrons. Um, and there's a lot of people that don't feel that right now. And um, we're not down with that, I guess. No, I'm and excited. also the other, the other thing I want to add is, is that um, often, I don't know if anybody else has experienced this, but after experience the harassment, um, the, 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 the kind of acknowledgement of the repair work was like, oh, you can help us design our first ever anti-harassment policy. And it was like, wait a second, how come the people who are harmed are responsible for also, um, addressing the harms and making it better for everyone? But, but the sole responsibility falls more on those who have been oppressed and that's why I think the PACT initiative is so great because it is a collaborative effort. It's about a conversation and it's a resource. The PACT is an amazing resource, which means that brewery leadership that might not want to do all the work, even though we're saying do the work, they're not then going to people in their organization and going, hey, you understand this. Help us write it. You're absolutely right. I mean, the goal with PACT is to be a resource. And that's an interesting transition because I, I want to talk about beer for a second. Betsy, I believe you're the one who coined this in one of our billion conversations we've had over the past long time. 
you said beer is the way in which we collaborate. And I immediately fell in love with that quote. However, I believe those eight words had us completely reevaluate what we were trying to do. And where does beer fall in the mix of PAC and our industry making more positive changes? Uh, you know, it's uh, it's how, so I have, I'm actually um, going to have a discussion. Um, we're having an event tonight where I'm going to talk about this very thing with Jeff Allworth, where uh, for me, so beer is a liquid form of bread. So like in my mind, um, beer is a form of breaking bread with people, right? And so when Dana talks about wanting to have this space where people gather and they're in um, relationship with each other, uh, that's what we do as people. We've always done it. Like it's a human thing since the beginning of civilization that we gather over food and drink and we provide, we have ritual around it. For some folks, it's spiritual experience. For some folks, it's um, an intellectual or emotional experience. Or for some people, it's all three of those things. Um, and so I think there's just something deeply human about, um, about gathering over beer and trying to make our communities better. Um, and so I, I think that when people in the industry who are providing this sort of um, platform to do these things and um, breweries provide community, whether they mean to or not, whether that's your mission or not, like <laughs> gathering spaces over food and beer is, is, is where so many important things happen um, in our lives. And so I just think that, um, I think that when we, when we can, bring beer into the conversation in a really intentional way. When we, when we actually point to this and we say like, Hey, this is a space where we can do some real good change. And this is a space where we can um, have these conversations. I think it's sort of our duty to do it. Um, at least it is for Lady J that goes back to that mission thing you brought up earlier is that um, it would be, uh, it would not be in aligned with Lady J's mission and values to ignore this problem. Right. So like, we, we have the means to hold space for this. So um, it's our obligation to do it. Just like it's my obligation to like clean all the tanks after I brew and like make sure that stuff doesn't taste bad. And I'm like following OSHA rules and submitting my TTB label, you know, all of that stuff. Um, I think this should just be a part of it where we're just having to do, this is just part of the work that we do. I agree with you. It should be our obligation to create safer and respectful places in the craft beverage industry. But for all of you, why do you believe it is important to trans beverage, transform beverage culture from within? As in those actually working in the industry. I mean, our consumers aren't going to do it for us. They mm -hmm. won't. Uh, no. And it's hard for them to understand, right? Because there's that, not that level of familiarity the same way, like if um, if I had a friend or something that was like, you know, selling software, right? And they spoke to me about an encounter, like in their cubicle or something. I have no, I could, I could, tr uh, you know, I would try to lead with empathy in that conversation, but I don't necessarily know exactly what that's like or how that would have played out in corporate culture because that's so foreign to me, right? So if that same friend came to me and said like, will you help contribute to a cause to like raise awareness of gender-based harassment and software sales? I would be like, uh, yeah, okay, sure. You know, yeah. Cause like I'm familiar with the concept, but it's um, I think it might be kind of hard for people to understand, especially cause I also, this might be too general of a statement. This, I, again, I make mistakes all the time. This might bite me in the ass later for saying this, but um, we have such as like, <laughs> craft beer is like this every person's beverage you know like not macro not corporate so like it's sort of that um come as you are casual you know what i do you get what i'm saying there like it's sort of um cool kid you know industry whatever you want to call it so you know and i get this like when i talk to friends or neighbors or people that i don't know very well. And I say, well, I'm in the craft beer industry. And they're like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. You must have the best life ever. Like, mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. right. And I think there's a lot of from the outside, like that's probably, it does probably look pretty cool. 
you know, like it does. I enjoy what I do. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean we're infallible. There's some shit that goes wrong. Right. Um, and before I forget this point, because I was thinking of this when Dana was talking, just to touch on this, the reason, just in case people ask why, the reason that you don't want to ask the people who have been harmed is because that rehashes trauma. And AJ can probably speak more about this and maybe they can shed some light on it more than I can because they're more trained than I am. But what that does is it just like opens an old wound and like pour some salt in it and like grinds it in there, you know, and that's not fun for anyone. Right. So what you're doing by asking those who have been harmed to consult going forward is that it's like, ugh, just getting beat over the head with mental trauma, you know? So just in case anybody was to wonder like, why can't I ask that person? Like they know firsthand, right? Like why I'm, I'm doing my part, right? I'm going to the source and asking for advice of it. No, it doesn't work like that. Um, and I'll just be blunt, you know, that's like asking your one black friend at work, like how it feels to be the black person at work. And can they help you understand what that's like? I'm going to get shit for that one too, but that's okay. Cause I'm making a point, right? I think AJ knows exactly what I'm talking. She know they know me so well at this point. Like it's, um, you know, that, but that's an analogy, like a blunt analogy that needs to be made, right? Like you just don't, you don't do that. You don't tread there you either barter or there's a, a value exchange at some point um education wise so all right, right. D aj dig me out of my hole that i'm in now <laughs> uh, want, when the culture shift happens it would be obvious why you don't want the the traumatized people to lead you on this it's it's a you everyone it's a community thing so it's a conversation that's led by everyone not just the folks that are, you know, being asked to, to re-traumatize themselves. So um, it empowers, if, if the intention is behind it, it, it empowers um, folks to begin to heal and to support one another. Um, it shows a commitment to, you know, walking the walk and rather than just, um, you know, I think I think it was you, Julie, who said something about how like this should just be rope, like a uh, tips training and stuff like that. It should be yes, but it also is it's deeper than that. It's it's a, a culture shift is not just something that we do because we're trying to stay within the legal limits of what how to to run a business. It's because we want to treat people with respect. We want it, it will be a no brainer to not want to traumatize our colleagues, you know, to to tell them that to lead our movement to to shift our our ourselves. We want to shift ourselves. That's what Safe Bars it, um, gives us language to do. Um, uh, I wanted to say something about how another reason why craft brewery industry lends itself to this very thing. As Betsy's been talking about how um, we rate bread over, we, we, we change the world over a beer. You know what I mean? We, we and over food and, and it, ha it happens, um, in bars and in breweries and in restaurants, because this is a human nature thing. It's something that we do ritualistically. It's something that we do um, just innately. Um, and so our, our intentions are, should also include being respectful and changing this culture. Like it, if, if the vehicle for these conversations is the beer, then our intentions should be the, one of the ingredients, as it already is, because craft beer is already so intentional. It, it, you know, we have a lot of breweries in the Rocky Mountains because of the, you know, rushing cold waters or something. And, um, you know, there's a, you know, a, a brewery in Pennsylvania that is a fam old family secret. You know, it's it, the industry lends itself to intentionality, and so it's you know, these craft beers taste better because of the intentionality. And this is just another ingredient that we're asking. And AJ, you know, why is just adopting a code of conduct, the Safe Bars Pact, such an important first step? It's an important first step because it's an acknowledgement of the importance of taking the step. You know what I mean? It's, it, it's not a continuance of sweeping things under the rug or hoping that it'll go away on its own. It's a, 
It's a standing and facing the issue. And that's what we're being asked to do right now. It's a reckoning. That's what you do when, when you come to a reckoning, you stand and face it or you run away or, you know, the best way to do it is to stand and face it and change it. Yeah. Now I want to change the focus just a little bit because the process that we've gone through together has been one of the most important parts of PAC for me. I mean, as we mentioned, it dared us to understand our goals, our motivations to, to get where we are today. And I'm extremely proud of what the Safe Bars PAC initiative has become. And this is because everyone here today and Lauren Taylor of Safe Bars, we opened up, we had tough conversations and we went through the process. Dana, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how we went through the process and why breweries need to go through processes like this to get to where they can be to be better? Sure. Yeah. Oh my like, where to start? Um, I think I talk about this a lot. So when we're really passionate and I say we, as in like anyone who does sort of, um, anyone who does work projects, any kind of work, when we're really passionate and excited about something, we, um, and if it's com we're also compelled because there's acts of oppression happening and we're motivated by social justice so that we're sitting in some discomfort that like passion and excitement mixed with that discomfort can make us want to move really quickly and just do all the activities, right? Like, you know, we have to do something and, and, and it's been difficult for me throughout my career and then also with the work that I do with other teams to address that that like urgency and sometimes that scarcity thinking like if I don't do it, no one will. Um, that's like a symptom of white supremacy culture. And, you know, especially if we're doing social justice based work, we need to interrogate that as well within our process of how we do our work. And so I think with this group, we slowed down. Like we really slowed down um, and we started, you know, talking about intentionality. We started being really intentional about the types of questions that we were asking one another um, to, to make sure that we had a shared purpose. Um, and then what was the parameters of that? Most importantly, this is a long-term commitment. Like this is not like um, something that we're, you know, this is not just safe bars, right? Safe bars is the organization they're taking it all on. And once it's released to the world, it's all on safe bars and we're just going to walk away. Like this is a collaborative response. It's not one organization, it's all of us. So we all have to show up and say, what are our contributions? What are our perspectives? Um, how can those, how can those be valued and integrated into the planning of this? And how can, what is our capacity to stay supporting one another and evolving this initiative over time because systemic change, what we're talking about, creating more welcoming spaces, belonging, it's a long term game. So how do we do that together? So that was a big part of this. And then even even now, like we've we've released the pact, but we're not in a rush to like get tons of signups. We're like, yeah, let's take it. Let's take it slow. Let's have really great conversations with with brewery owners, with people in our networks. Um, because this isn't going away anytime soon. No, that's a fantastic point because we're not on a time frame right now. The, the PACT initiative, you know, ideally will live forever and continually help put more positive positivity into the craft beverage industry. And so for Dana, we talked a lot about how we kind of looked at our motivations in the process to get to where we are today. Even before a brewery signs on for something like the PACT, what types of conversation should they be having internally to see next steps for themselves before they even decide to you know, reach out to someone like the PACT initiative or safe bars? Anyone have any thoughts on what can happen within that brewery space before they even take the steps to reach outward? Like, can you repeat the question? I was thinking about what Dana had said earlier. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we talked a lot about the process we went through to kind of understand ourselves and to get to that product we wanted to put out. What should a brewery do internally to interact with their staff, owners, staff, everyone that they're involved with to determine, you know, what they should be doing internally before reaching out to someone like Safe Bars? I mean, they need to make sure they have a mission statement. So they need to just look at their long-term goals and how this plays in the picture. 
brewery people are busy. You know, I think that's something we, we, we all know and crap every people are, you know, very busy people. So what conversations should they be having internally to realize that they want to make a positive change? Core values. That's the first one for anybody who's worked with me out here. That's watching this. They're like, Oh, Julie's going to talk about core values again. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it's, I, it's a great place to get started. Uh, it's what, you know, what are you about? You know what I mean? Like, what are you, what are you really trying to accomplish? If I had a dollar for every time we had uh, like moments of silence working with Dana um, where you could literally see everybody's faces on zoom, like gears are turning and like steam starting to come out of people's ears, but like, we're not saying anything. Those were awesome moments. And I wish that for owners and operators, right? Like just put some thought work into it. Um, I think everybody has this, I say everybody, that's too much of a generalization. The majority of small to medium sized craft breweries out there, it's like you want to get in the game, right? And you're anxious because you're passionate about what you're doing and you want to jump in there and start selling beer immediately and spread your passion with people and all that kind of stuff. But um, it would be like, you know, buying a turnkey, like 30 barrel brew house when you've only homebrewed something in like a five gallon, you know, a gumbo bucket, you know what I mean? In your kitchen. Like it's just, it's, um, again, you got to walk before you run, right? So you need the vital ingredients before you scale up. So even if you already have an established business and you're up and running and you have staff and all that kind of stuff, there's never a bad time to like go backwards and then like reverse engineer your way out of it um, and get to like, what are you building? You know, Dana, like what kind of organization, what kind of environment are you building? What kind of Betsy talks about the community that you're building? Like what, you know, with uh, Betsy, with your talk at CBC and Andrew, you were part and Allison was part of that too. Like what kind of community are you building? What kind of steward stewardship are you leading? What are you trying to accomplish? Because what you're doing goes beyond liquid, right? So uh, what kind of environment do we want? What kind of legacy do we want to leave? What kind of community do we want to build? And then how does your staff fit into that? And do they have a full understanding of that? Do they want to be that in the environment? And have you given them the tools to be in that environment? And then start from there, right? And if you don't have something like uh, an employee handbook or a code of conduct or performance improvement plans or you know, core values that you focus everything on, um, start talking about it. Nobody's going to fault you for ask question, asking questions. That's another thing too. I think, I don't think, um, you can ever get to the point where you over communicate with your team. Um, that's why I'm a big fan of like open book management and stuff like that, because I, I, I don't know. It's called a bunch of all this other stuff too, like horizontal organizations and things like that, because it is a sharing of ideas, um, so yeah, I would encourage people just talk to people, talk to people that are on your team, talk to your community, get feedback. And something that happens when, so what happens when you don't do this, right? Is that, um, is that your staff and your customers, they don't necessarily know how you feel about these issues and they should. So like as a business owner, I, I should want to take a look at what type of space do I want? Lady Justice tap room to be. Um, what type of liquor stores and restaurants do I want my beer to be in? And then how do I want people to feel when they drink my beer? But also how do I want people to feel when they're talking to other people in the tap room, when they're talking to their staff? I should absolutely want people to, to feel like they should be safe in the space. I should want people to not want to um, be harassed or assault, assaulted just because they wanted to come out and have a beer. And I think, I think everybody should feel that way um, about their own businesses. And so when you don't communicate that, what happens is if you have an incident that happens in your tap room, if, if you do have somebody on staff who is harassing or assaulting another person on staff, it's a whole lot easier to take a look at that situation and say, no, that's not what we're about and we're going to fix it. 
instead of saying like, oh no, that can never happen here. That's not the type of brewery we are. Like it, so not having these things figured out, not sorting through these tough questions, not having core values, it'll set you up to just be able to deny what's actually going on instead of facing it head on. Cause it's just, it's just so much easier when you, when you know, when you know what your business is about and, and what you do and do not do, it makes these conversations happen so much more authentically than, than if you're just kind of like drowning and floundering. Cause I think a lot of times what we see is like a complaint will go to a manager and a manager's like, Oh, no way that could happen here. I've never seen it happen here. So that's not what happens here. And if you're doing what Julie's talking about, being a little bit more open, having more communication with your staff and with your patrons, you start to understand that maybe this stuff does happen here. And maybe we do need to make some shifts or, you know, maybe there are things we can do to make sure that it doesn't happen here because we haven't had the problem yet. So what are we doing right? And how do we keep going to make sure um, that we're being as, as intentional as, and as safe as we possibly can be. And AJ, when a brewery or business gets involved with safe bars and goes through this through the training, what can they expect? Um, well, they can certainly expect frank and open conversation about uh, the very thing that Betsy was just talking about. Um, um, I think the one of the reasons why Safe Bar was, wanted to get involved in this was because we are at a very very poignant moment in craft brewing where you are having a me too reckoning right and it's a perfect opportunity to illustrate the fact that bessie was just talking about like yeah you can have a family-run business you can have the best intentions you can have um you know uh you can already have these discussions internally but if your community doesn't know that you're having the conversations if your staff doesn't know then that culture can still this element that we're talking about that we're trying to come back and still infiltrate. So um, what you can expect with Safe Bars is we're gonna have the frank conversation. We're gonna talk to you about um, why um, the very fact that uh, craft brewing is so popular and so uh, integral to our, you know, being a creative species and, and having conversations with one another is also what opens the slight door for this kind of element to come in because it, it loosens our trust. Um, it, it, hel it um, helps us to connect with one another and then people who have bad intentions come in and utilize those, um, those kind of cracks. Um, and we want to recognize those things and we want to have the conversations and, and stop it before it can infiltrate, if that makes sense. Um, Historically and traditionally, sexual assault, harassment, things like this, these things are not talked about openly. You know, just in everyday life, not just not only in the, the craft brewing industry or the restaurant industry. These things are considered, quote unquote, like taboo. Like we don't talk about them. Um, these instances are, are underreported. But now that we have this opportunity, now that these things have come to light, we um, safe bars will just allow us to easily have this, these conversations and give us the language to do that. And have you seen more breweries reaching out to you? In yeah, the past year than we have. Um, um, even there was an uptick even before we we launched pack, but but since we launched pack, we still we we're getting more interest. Yes. Now we talk a lot about transforming from within and. I kind of want to change the focus of the conversation for a minute from the transformation we've all undergone undergone from within. And as a, I'll use Dana's term, double entrepreneur, who I don't often work in teams. I'm not going to lie. I was a little unsure how this teamwork would play out. We're essentially five people who are involved in five different organizations, all of which have different ways that we operate. How could we come together through Zoom and efficiently create an initiative that made a difference? And the answer, which we found out over time, we did it through a lot of conversation. We did it through trust. And we did it because we all have the desire to somehow make the craft beverage industry a better place. And through this process, you know, I learned so much about myself, all of you, and just the industry in a whole. And I would love to hear how each of you were transformed by the process to get to where we are today. Just one little takeaway, positive or negative. There's something about the experience that stands out to you of, you know, working with others outside of your typical 
you know, daily interactions. Don't be shy. I'll, I'll, one thing that stands out for me um, collaborating with y'all is that um, because of Dana's like masterful kind of um, wrangling us, we were able to get to the, the meat of what we wanted to do quicker than most other collaborations that I, I've been a part of because, you know, our, we got to know our personalities um, in a way that was kind of streamlined rather than having to do that kind of work and how, how do you work and what would you feel in, in this encounter kind of thing, we were able to cut through that um, and get to our goal and our mission quicker, so. Yeah, I think just, you know, having an opportunity, kind of what Julie was saying earlier, to just be able to sit in a space for a little while and actually have permission to think a little bit deeply and um, be able to have permission to just speak frankly and honestly um, with each other is, is good too. Um, but yeah, just being able to hold space for this, I think was really important and to hold it very intentionally was, was good. Which I, I was just gonna say, it's, we're role modeling, we're role modeling what we're saying is possible for beverage organizations who go through, um, you know, the talking about core values, looking at their code of conduct, why do they even want a code of conduct, um, safe bars training and other resources, like in actually interrogating their onboarding and training programs and going like, one, do we even have one? Uh, two, do you know what what's within it? I mean, I worked for an organization that won for years, won Canada's best employer. And it wasn't until um, uh, recently when when my partner and I were about to start a brewery and we were thinking about the onboarding and training program we would want to have that I started interrogating and going, well, what was missing anti-racism training, like active bystander, you know, talking about sexual harassment, like all these things that was mentioned that, you know, is obviously we don't have honest, frank conversations. And so I think this group in this process, like really helped um, normalize that process and how we're not here to, we're not here to, um, uh, to check boxes, we're, we're here to actually grow and learn and develop and make mistakes and there are no failures, it's just all data. And and Adrian Marie Brown said that, not me, that brilliant quote. Um, but yeah, so that's a lot what I've learned is like that what we're role modeling is a process that actually I can adopt with Endswell and I also know is totally possible for other beverage organizations to do as well. Like you. You, you don't need to um, have it all figured out. That's the whole point. That's why you reach out to others and you collaborate with others because you don't know everything. Yeah. That, Dana says it's so weird. That, well, that's hard to follow, but it's, um, I think tr the transformation that I was thinking of most is that it really, uh, projects like this made me slow down and really listen to other perspectives and know that um, I wish I could just have a whole session about things that Dana taught us um, <laughs> about how, you know, you come into conversations with certain intentions, right? Like you have an idea of like, okay, this is how I feel about this project. And this is um, my viewpoint and I'm going to express it. And, um, and then you quickly realize how narrow that is when you're exposed to so many other viewpoints, right? So, you know, you're all talking about the same thing, but it's so interesting to hear other contributions from other viewpoints, right? And from other parts of the world and from other industries and from wherever else, right? Because we're all different. And then sitting there and just sitting with that, just sitting with that and thinking, wait, we're talking about the same thing. I never thought about X, Y, Z in that way ever. Right. And then once you have that kind of discovery, you can never go backwards. 
that's my, I think my, that's my biggest takeaway from this is that you're aware, you're like hyper aware of the lack of perspective that people have. And I don't think you can ever go back to being like, oh, I'm going to come into this conversation with this purpose and I'm going to, you know, my way or the highway and I'm not going to listen to anything else. So um, I feel like Dana taught us how to listen. And I, I hope, I hope that more people in our industry can learn to do that because it is absolutely mind blowing and, and eye opening. Um, you know, when you can think like, wait, I might be wrong about this and that's okay. So what now I know, right. And I think if anything, our industry should be able to grasp onto this better than anyone else. Think about it. Like if you would ask me 10 years ago, if people were going to be drinking, um, hazy IPAs, I would have been like, <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. Right. If <laughs> you like get something that looks like orange juice, get out of here. Right. Like, it, it, but I'm saying our level of innovation is at that point. Like we can, we've made that evolution with recipes. We just have to carry it over to infrastructure. That's my rally cry for everybody. That's a good rally cry, Julie. <laughs> you know, and, and I truly hope that this initiative can help unite the industry and literally get people to make a long-term commitment to establishing safer and more respectful, you know, work and drinking spaces. I mean, we're so passionate about this. We're passionate about beer. Let's make the next 10 years of craft beverage even better than this before, before and just see much more positive changes. And for the four of you, is there anything else you would like to add today? Thank you yeah. to everyone that was part of this project. I am so incredibly grateful and so honored to get to work with each and every one of you on this. And I am definitely a better person because of it. And I think our industry is going to be better for it. So just thanks. And it's not an easy process, but it's such a rewarding process when you dedicate yourself to just simply being better. Definitely. And thank you, Andrew, for providing this platform and the conference and ever in um, the master facilitator. So thank you. I'm lucky <laughs> enough to hang out with four great people like you tonight. So with, with that said, Betsy, AJ, Dana, and Julie, thank you all for the friendship. This has been a great conversation as always. I look forward to the next. And everybody, safebarspack.org. We would love to be part of the positive change in the industry. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Bye, everybody.